Beauty comes in many forms. One form that few of us take time to appreciate is the world of moths and butterflies. There are over 180 species of butterflies in North Carolina and between two and 3,000 species of moths. Today we are going to explore the world of moths and butterflies. Beauty with six legs. We at Exploring North Carolina know that there are other beautiful insects in our state, including magnificent beetles. And delicate dragonflies. For most of us, however, both farm kids and city kids, butterflies and moths are the beauty contest winners. Jeff Pippin and Will Cook, researchers at Duke University, are among a growing number of North Carolinians who are avid butterfly watchers. I asked Jeff Pippin how he got started. Well, in college, I took an ornithology class that got my interest in birds and moved down to North Carolina and was doing a lot of birding and uh, ornithology related things, going out in the field a lot with folks that started looking at butterflies. And as bird activity is real high in the morning, but starts to dwindle off mid morning, that's when the sun comes out and warms up and the, and the air gets warmer. And so butterflies start flying more, and so it's easy to kind of switch from birding to butterflying or, or mingle the two. There are about 175 species of butterflies in North Carolina. There are probably two or 3,000 or more species of moths. Butterflies and moths together make up the insect order Lepidoptera, meaning scaled wings. Their wings are covered with thousands of tiny scales that give them the patterns of color and structure and so forth that we see. With 175 species of butterflies, it's a lot of butterflies, but it's a manageable number that you can learn to identify and hopefully attract to your yard if you're inter interested in butterfly gardening or go out into the field to try to find these like a birder would go birding. You know, butterflies like to go butterflying to try to find and identify different species of butterflies. Butterflies and moths are very important members of the ecosystem. Not only are they pretty for us to go look at and identify and attract to the yard, but they're also key players in a lot of food webs. The caterpillars are a major source of food for many species of birds. The adult butterflies and moths are major sources of food for birds, bats, lizards, frogs, other creatures that eat small invertebrates. Butterflies and moths are also very important pollinators. A lot of species of plants would not be able to exist without having their butterfly or moth pollinate the flowers to keep the plant's uh, life cycle going. During a visit to Duke Forest, I asked Jeff for a quick overview of the life cycle of butterflies. The life cycle of a butterfly has four main stages. You could ask the question, which came first, the butterfly or the egg? The adult female butterfly lays the eggs. The eggs, very tiny little structures, usually laid on leaves of the host plant or nearby them. The eggs then hatch into a little itty bitty caterpillar. The caterpillar takes several days to weeks to feed on the leaf material usually. That caterpillar then forms a chrysalis or a pupa, uh, which undergoes metamorphosis. And finally, the adult butterfly emerges. The adult butterfly may only last you know, one or two or three weeks in many cases. Say a tiger swallowtail adult butterfly probably lives two or three weeks. You know, a monarch, on the other hand, might live eight months, 
but some of the smaller skippers mainly live a week or 10 days. So when we think of butterflies, we think of seeing them on warm sunny days in our yard flying around and that's the only time they're around. But really they're around us all the time. They might be there as an egg or as a chrysalis or as a caterpillar on a leaf in a tree in your backyard. Uh, but they're always there in one form or another, and the adults are surprisingly short-lived. Want to know the best time to look for butterflies? Jeff shared these observations with me. While there are about 175 species of butterflies in North Carolina, you'll never be able to go to one place and find all of them at once. And the reason for that is different species of butterflies have different habitat requirements, specifically different requirements for host plants and nectar plants. Host plants are the plant species that the caterpillars feed on. Nectar plants are the plant species that produce flowers that the adults can obtain nectar from. And different plants grow in different habitats scattered throughout the state. Therefore, with different habitat requirements for the plants, you've got different habitat requirements for the butterflies. If you want to go look for butterflies or add butterflies to your hiking experience, you want to go on warm, sunny days. Butterflies are cold-blooded insects and so they don't fly when it's rainy or cool out. So go to open areas where there's plenty of sunshine, it's warm enough. Look at flowers. We know that nectar plants bring in and attract butterflies, so you want to look at areas where there's lots of flowers. And then look at the flowers. You may normally walk by a field has flowers in it, but this time take a pause and look and you'll see that some of those flowers have butterflies on them. After getting more focused on butterflies, following our visit with Jeff and others, we couldn't stop looking along roads, in fields, and in forest. On one stop, we were filming zebra swallowtails, only to happen upon a mother green heron, whose eggs began to hatch in a button bush covered by butterflies. As a keen observer and collector of butterflies, I asked Jeff Pippin about the tools of his hobby and about puddle parties. To look for butterflies in the field, some field equipment is helpful. A good pair of close focusing binoculars, one that will allow you to focus within about six feet, will really enable you to get a close look at that butterfly for study or identification purposes. Also, if you want to collect butterflies, traditionally people have taken nets and used pins and mounting boards and so forth, and that's fine for scientific study or some collections, but I find that I prefer to collect them with a camera. And the technology allows us now to get a relatively inexpensive digital camera uh, that takes wonderful close-up photos. mud and wet areas uh, around dirt, stream banks, things like that. They attract butterflies. And you can get puddle parties of butterflies that are on the mud taking in nutrients and salts. You may walk by a puddle on the trail and a bunch of butterflies will flush up. Because Jeff specializes in butterflies, I took my questions about the differences between moths and butterflies to Jesse Perry our longtime friend at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Now, a lot of people ask me what the differences are between moths and butterflies. And there are many of them, but a few that are easy to observe and simple are, one, moths generally fly around at night, and butterflies generally fly around during the day. Now, there are exceptions, but it's a pretty good rule of thumb. Now, if you look at the head of a moth or a butterfly, there are antennae sticking out from it. And in butterflies, the antennae are shaped like simple rods, straight rods with little knobs at the end. In moths, 
They can be shaped like a diversity of things. Some have uh, antennae shaped like ferns, some like a bottle brush, and some like little whips, but with no knobs on the end. Jesse cautioned me that there are exceptions to these general rules, and one is the daytime flying bumblebee look-alike, the bumblebee moth, sometimes called a hummingbird moth because of its erratic flight pattern. The term that best describes the life cycle of these insects is complete metamorphosis. Jesse explained this concept in detail. Insects grow up in basically one of two ways. Uh, the simplest form is an incomplete metamorphosis where the little insect hatches out of an egg and like a little cricket, it looks a lot like the adult. And it grows, sheds its skin a few times, gets to be a bigger cricket, and then finally sheds into a stage where it grows wings and is an adult. And this is incomplete metamorphosis, not very much change uh, in the growth cycle. Now moths and butterflies uh, have a much more profound change from the little creature that hatches out of their egg to when they become an adult. They hatch out as a little caterpillar, a little wormy looking thing, and eventually grow up to be something entirely different. This is a complete metamorphosis. So how does this happen? Well, the caterpillar hatches out, it eats, 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 and can grow from a tiny half inch long a black caterpillar into the huge hickory horn devil over five inches long in a few short weeks. Now when they've had enough to eat, they stop and usually crawl off of the food plant and look for a place to go through this complete change of body form. Some moths dig a hole right down into the earth and make themselves a chamber underground. Others crawl off and spin a silken cocoon around themselves. The silk comes out of the mouth parts and the caterpillar has to weave it back and forth, back and forth, and finally all these fibers coalesce into a kind of a hardened, almost shell-like structure. So the cocoon is actually the clothing that the caterpillar spins for itself. Most butterfly caterpillars do it a little differently. After they finish eating, they too will often crawl off of their host plant and look for a place to hang themselves up. And they'll suspend themselves by a little pad of silk, either upside down or maybe alongside a twig. And then they'll shed their skin into something that has no legs, head, any really identifiable feature that would indicate it's an insect. They're usually camouflage. They may look like a dead leaf, a live leaf, some bird droppings, uh, or even a twig. And this is known as a chrysalis. This is the actual organism itself. If you touch a chrysalis, you're touching the actual animal. It's not a covering like a moth cocoon, which is just silk, but the actual animal itself. I'm sure you're wondering, is the silk from North Carolina silk moths the same as that produced by Chinese silk moths sought by early explorers? Bob Alderink, a longtime museum educator, found the answers for us. Absolutely, this is real silk. Uh, they're called silk moths, the Saturnids are called that for a, for a reason. Uh, this is a Cecropia cocoon, and what you're seeing here is the outer part of that cocoon, but if you remove it, you'll see this inner cocoon, which is very similar to the Chinese silkworm in, in appearance. And actually, they're both the same kinds of silk. They're both real silk, that you could actually unwind this strand. You could actually make a silk tie if you wanted to with this. So what do these cocoons look like when they're actually unraveled? This is it right here. This is actually North Carolina silk. This was featured, uh, this was displayed at a state fair here in North Carolina uh, many, many years ago. But this is the real thing. This is a, um, silk cocoons that have just been unraveled onto a reel. And that's why they call this reeled silk. I still needed to know how a worm-like caterpillar changes to a butterfly or moth. Jesse explained that in complete metamorphosis, as the fully grown caterpillar morphs into the pupa, unseen cells called imaginal disc,
transform into wings, body parts, and antenna that bear no resemblance to the caterpillar. Thus, there is complete metamorphosis. Once I found out that you had to have caterpillars to have the beautiful moths and butterflies, I started planting plants just for the caterpillars, and this was successful. And I also adopted the mindset that I could share some of my plants with the caterpillars. For instance, I didn't mind some of the caterpillars eating my parsley because I knew they were going to turn into beautiful black swallowtail adults. Now the caterpillars themselves were very interesting. Some were as beautiful or more beautiful than the moths or butterflies. They had a huge variety of shapes, defensive mechanisms, colors, and bizarre body protrusions. Scientists at the museum are asked countless questions each year about insects, especially during Bug Fest, the museum's annual insect extravaganza. No one answers more questions than Bill Reynolds, director of the Arthropod Zoo. Uh, for studying butterflies and moths every spring and summer, we get a lot of phone calls, particularly about butterfly gardens. How do I maximize the butterflies and moths, they're coming to my flowers. What kind of flowers can I plant? What can I do to have the most number of species of butterflies coming into my garden? But at the same time, second question that generally follows, and this is a little later in the season, what can I do to get rid of all these, these worms that are eating up my butterfly garden? I, I've put out all these plants and I have these green striped worms and these black spiny worms and you just wouldn't believe it. I planted many, many plants, hundreds of plants, all in my butterfly garden, and now they're just stems and sticks. These worms are just eating them. Is there anything I can spray on these worms that won't hurt the butterflies and the moths? And I say, well, first of all, they're not worms. The things you're talking about are caterpillars, which are the larvae of butterflies and moths. And in order to maximize or to accommodate a butterfly garden, which the flowers, of course, do feed the adults, you have to also accommodate every stage in the life cycle. With so many species of moths and butterflies in North Carolina, I asked Bill Reynolds if caterpillars harm trees. Uh, people have this perception that a plant, with its leaves or its needles or its foliage and flowers, any degree of gnawing on leaves or holes in the leaves or, or branches that have been defoliated and they go out there and they find these caterpillars and they're just munching and eating, their opinion or the first in, in impression people get is that this is a bad thing and that it's hurting the plant, it's gonna kill my tree. Well, trees lose their leaves every winter anyway and they refoliate typically in the spring so defoliation isn't going to kill a tree. Most of the defoliation we see on things like oaks, we see late summer, early, mid-autumn, when these trees are already a month to maybe at the most six weeks away from losing their leaves anyway. The caterpillars ingest the leaves. Oak leaves being high in tannins take a long time to decompose. Caterpillars poop. This is called frass. The frass is little pellets of fertilizer. That'd be a good way to think of it. Probably a better fertilizer than you can buy because it isn't going to burn the grass or the roots below. And this is kind of nature's way of recycling. It rains. Fertilizer is washed immediately into the soil. Hence, you have fertilizer for the tree the next spring. Boom, it grows, puts out new leaves, and everything's fine. As a researcher for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, Bill Reynolds is no desk jockey. He can often be found in car lots, around convenience stores, and at shopping centers, in the middle of the night looking for moths. Exploring North Carolina followed him one evening. Uh, sphinx moths are another group that people see frequently. Many of those are active either in the daytime or right at dusk, right at dawn when there's still a lot of human activity, people out in the yard, you know, in their gardens, and they see these large moths look like hummingbirds, whiz in, whiz out. They're extremely fast flying, very well um, coordinated 
People are surprised to find out that a sphinx moth is not a species, but a family. Here in North Carolina, we have many, many species of sphinx moths um, that complete their entire life cycle here within our state, as well as a number of species that are occasional strays. Butterflies and moths have a tremendous diversity of defense mechanisms, particularly as adults, well actually in every life stage, but it's the adults that we're most familiar with. Many are brightly colored, displaying, eat me, get sick, don't eat me, have a good day. Um, other species look like dead leaves, um, they can look like bark, um, they can look like a lot of things that they aren't, even thorns or twigs, depending on how the leaves fold and roll. Moths, perhaps even more interestingly, have the adaptations to perceive and hear bats. Moths have certainly been flying in the air before there were bats flying in the air, and bats, once they accomplished flight, um, got to feed on the moths that were there. Um, many moths have hearing uh, mechanisms or ears, uh, tympanic membranes behind the last pair of legs that actually hear the sonar of bats, and as a bat approaches, the moth may take evasive action, fly erratically. Many of them just completely stop flying altogether and just drop. Actually, many of these large moths can fly with a tremendous amount of wing damage. I know that butterflies and moths occupy an important niche in our ecosystems, but I wanted to know from Bill if they are also indicators. Butterflies and moths are also, particularly their presence or absence, and also in the dynamics of the populations of the species you see, indicators of environmental health. Much like amphibians, as people are coming to know, butterflies and moths um, can indicate a number of problems in, in the environment. No matter where you live in North Carolina, the unseen world of moths and butterflies is part of your life. We urge you to plant a butterfly and moth garden with host plants such as oak and sweet gum, cherry, pawpaw, passion fruit, and willow. Plant nectar plants like lilies, coneflower, button bush, milkweed, and bee balm. Mirror, mirror on the wall, what's the fairest bug of all? Today we have shown you fritillaries, buckeyes, swallowtails, and sulfurs, giant saturnids, and sphinx moths. You be the judge of our beauty contest while exploring North Carolina.